Hey everybody, this is Holly Robinson and we're going to be doing Microbiology Part 3 PowerPoint. So we're going to be talking about protists right now. Now, protists are in the domain Eukarya and in the kingdom Protista. They kind of have their own kingdom. And they're typically unicellular and you have to be able to look at them under the microscope. And they're not really a plant or an animal or a fungus, but they're actually... The ancient ancestor to fungi, plants, and animals, supposedly. Now, protists can be unicellular, colonial, or multicellular. They can be in clumps, very close together. They can be structurally diverse. Okay, uh, the Protista kingdom is typically has lots, lots of variety and diversity. Um, they may have a shell, a cell wall, or a shell. Um, or kind of a specific sort of shell called a test, which we'll talk about later. They may have organelles that are not found in other eukaryotes, and a lot of them carry out asexual reproduction. And they may be able to sexually reproduce at times. A lot of them will form spores to help them reproduce, and they may have very complicated, strange kind of life cycles. Now, Protists are traditionally classified by their source of energy, that is, whether they photosynthesize or whether they're heterotrophic, and they're also classified by their nutrients or what type of food they take in. Now, algae tend to be photosynthetic. They make their own food. And then protozoans, they're heterotrophic. They have to ingest food or get food from an outside source. And then water molds and slime molds, those are heterotrophic, and they actually absorb. Um, they basically latch onto things and then take the nutrients out of them. Okay. Now, here are the six different categories for protists. We have photosynthetic protists like algae and then we have protozoans which are the flagellates, ciliates, amoeboids or the sporozoans and then we have the fungus-like protists which are your slime molds and your water molds. So we'll take each of these kind of one at a time and they think that all of these different categories of protists came from one uh, eukaryotic ancestor. Now, photosynthetic protists kind of tend to be like plants, for instance, algae. They can be multicellular, they can be unicellular, colonial, um, they can clump up, or they can be filamentous or have lots of filaments. Sometimes they can be very, very small, either unicellular, up to about 100 feet long, or seaweed. And they're a component of phytoplankton in aqueous environment, which is just basically uh, food down on the lower part of the food chain. They do have chloroplasts that have chlorophyll in them, and they typically have a very rigid cell wall. So these are the type of protists that tend to kind of act like plants and look like plants. Now, photosynthetic protists, um, like green algae, they're a really important food source for marine organisms. There's actually a lot of algae that is used in our food. Okay. The cell walls will contain cellulose. Um, they have chlorophyll A and B, and they store their food as starch, just like plants do. And then diatoms, those are the most numerous unicellular algae in the ocean, and they have these really crazy-looking shells that are made of silica. And then... You have dinoflagellates. Now, dinoflagellates are really interesting because they are best known for causing a red tide. Red tide. And that red tide um, has saxitoxin in it, which occurs naturally in algae tides. And it produces a, that toxin that gets into shellfish. And so if you've ever heard of paralytic shellfish poisoning, that's because of dinoflagellates that cause the red tide and basically mollusks tend to ingest these dinoflagellates and then we as humans will eat these oysters or clams or mussels and then we get it you know into our bodies and 0 0.2 milligrams is fatal to a human just so you know and there's actually some scientists that believe that the um 
plague in, in Exodus, in the Bible, that talks about the Nile River turning to blood, that actually think that may have been a red tide or caused by um, saxitoxin. Okay, a red tide or the dinoflagellates that can cause this red tide. Okay, and they typically are photosynthetic too. Now, here are just some green algae. We have Chlamydomonas, okay, which looks kind of scary, but it's just green algae. We have Volvox and Aspirogyra, and then Ulva going across there. And on your left there, those are diatoms. And then on the right, those are dinoflagellates. Okay, just so you know, you never want to fish near a red tide or pull up any kind of, you know, mussels or oysters or anything um, near anywhere near a red tide. And that's what these dinoflagellates look like right here. Now, photosynthetic protists, we have red algae, and those are mainly seaweeds. They have red and blue pigments and chlorophyll also, and they produce a lot of gelling agents like auger, which is used in microbiology lab to grow cultures of bacteria. And then we also have carrageenan, and that is a polysaccharide that's used as a thickener or a stabilizer that you find in almond milk or coconut milk. It's been used for a lot long, long time excuse me, in food preparation because carrageenan has really good um, gelling properties. Now, brown algae, um, that's just seaweed too, and it ranges in color from kind of a tan to a blackish color, and you see that with kelps, and um, there are parts in the world like the Sargasso Sea that has lots of brown algae, okay, and the Sargasso Sea is in the North Atlantic Ocean, just so you know. Okay. Now, flagellates, they typically tend to be divided into protists that resemble animals like a zooflagellate or those that resemble plants like euglena. Now, um, a lot of them are kind of symbiotic, um, like they have mutualistic relationships. A lot of them are parasitic. Okay? They have to get their food from a host. Okay? Um, and flagellates typically have flagella and they just have this whip-like tail that helps them get around. And euglena, or euglenoids, those are unicellular organisms that live in like pond water. Some have chloroplasts, some don't. Um, they typically have two flagella and an eye spot and a plasma membrane. And we'll show you a picture of euglena here in just a second. Now, um, another one to know about, Trypanosoma brucei, that is the cause of African sleeping sickness and that's transmitted by the tsetse fly. It makes you very, very sick. And this type of flagellate attacks the patient's blood and through the tsetse fly, basically you get bitten by a tsetse fly and then it's transmitted into your body. And Trypanosoma brucei causes inflammation that decreases oxygen flow to the brain. So people that have this illness feel very, very tired and really lethargic, hence the name. Okay. And then Chagas disease, that is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, which is transmitted um, there, and it tends to bite the lips of humans, so it's called the kissing bug. And it's also transmitted through bed bugs. Okay. And Chagas disease um, kills victims later at times through sudden heart disease or digestive failure, so it can stay in your body for a long time. Um, both of these uh, illnesses, African sleep sickness and then Chagas disease, tend to be very deadly if they go untreated. And then we have a very harmless euglena here. This is what it looks like. And you can find it just in pond water. It's a flagella. Okay, there's its long flagellum right there. Okay, and just a whip-like tail that helps it get around. And if you notice, it's got um, a nucleus and a nucleolus. Okay, and vacuoles and chloroplasts. It's got a lot of the same organelles that um, more sophisticated organisms have, like plants and animals. And here's what it looks like underneath a microscope. Now, ciliates. Ciliates are the largest group of protozoans and they all have cilia, which are these little hairs that actually help them move and help them 
find food and most of them tend to move around freely some of them are anchored like on rocks or the ocean floor for instance paramecium's those are found just in pond water and if you cut them in half they will regenerate they conjugate themselves that way they have very visible vacuoles and nuclei okay, here's a stentor this is um, an anchored ciliate just so you know okay. there's a cilia on top and here's a paramecium this is what it looks like under a microscope and then just a picture Okay, in the cilia are just these little hairs. Okay, here's another picture of them conjugating or splitting themselves in two. Now, amoeboids. Amoeboids move by pseudopods, and pseudopod means false foot. And it's basically kind of like the blob, and the cytoplasm is going to stream forward in a certain direction to help it find food or move around and you can find it in fresh water or salt water and it feeds by surrounding its prey and just trapping it like phagocytosis and there's some types of amoebas or amoeboids that can cause dysentery the into amoeba you can also have negleria phalari which is a brain eating amoeba which is the um, video clip that I want you to watch okay, from the monsters inside me Okay. And then there's also some amoeboids that help make really tall structures. Hold on. Okay. Hold on one second. This is a picture of a general um, amoeboid. Um, it's false foot or it's pseudopod, helps it move around, and then it's got a nucleus and vacuoles and plasma membrane and cytoplasm, just like normal other organisms. Now, foraminiferans and globergerina hope I'm saying that right. Those are types of amoeboid protists and actually the shells or scales of these organisms over millions of years, get this, have just sank to the bottom of the ocean and basically they got accumulated and buried and compressed into limestone. And this limestone of the White Cliffs of Dover, okay, these white cliffs are Dover, they're made up of limestone or calcium carbonate, and they tend to be 300 feet tall, and they stretch along for 8 miles in Dover, England. Okay, And just so you know, that's made up of basically the shells or the scales and the remains of amoeboids that have just been stacked up and trampled and pressed down for millions of years. And these radiolarian tests right here, radiolarians, that's a type of protozoan, it's found in the upper layers of all oceans, okay, and they typically are spherically symmetrical, they're known for being complex, beautifully sculptured little creatures right here, and their sculptured skeletons are known as tests, T-E-S-T-S, -E okay, and these amoeboids have pseudopods that extend out through these skeletons, okay, and these skeletal remains settle to the ocean floor eventually and they're made into sedimentary rock over millions of years. Okay? And you find that these radiolarians eventually, over millions of years, turn into like flint and chert, okay? materials like that. Now, sporozoans are kind of interesting and they produce spores. Okay? Now, Spores are these asexual reproductive or these resting cells capable of developing into a new organism and they do not have to fuse with another cell. So spores are not like gametes where they have to fuse with like the sperm and the egg. No, spores are just asexual uh, resting cells or reproductive cells that are able to develop into a new organism without fusing with another one. And they tend to be non-motile, they don't move, they have these real complex life cycles. A lot of them, or really all of them, are parasites. Okay. And they have a complex that's used in attacking a host cell. Okay. They have um, organelles and enzymes for attacking host cells very easily. Okay. Now, malaria is one of the most widespread dangerous sporozoan disease and is spread by mosquitoes, okay. and um, malaria is, 
is terrible disease and you find it in many parts of the world and according to National Geographic if you add up all the total number of people that have ever been alive half of that number will have had malaria and it's very dangerous and you know pretty deadly particularly in other parts of the world okay. other spo sporozoan diseases that are important to know toxoplasmosis is caused by toxoplasma um, sporozoans and it is very dangerous to pregnant uh, women and also uh, the the uh, excuse me fetuses. Pregnant women um, are not supposed to empty litter boxes or work outside where cats defecate, and toxoplasmosis can be caught can be spread through cat feces. Okay, it's transmitted by cat feces and is harmful to a developing fetus, and so if you've ever been expecting or know someone who's been expecting and the doctor questions them about do they have cats in their house or do they have cats that defecate in their yard or in their garden that's why it's because of toxoplasmosis it's harmful to a developing fetus okay. and then cryptosporidium cryptosporidiums real common in surface waters and then the feces of animals and birds and the scary thing about cryptosporidium, it's unaffected by chlorine treatment and it can pass through sand filters in water treatment plants. Okay. So you can find it in bird droppings, things like that. Not all bird droppings, but you know, sometimes. Now, this is the life cycle of how malaria gets into a patient. Okay. And Basically, you get a female Anopheles mosquito bites uh, a human, okay, and the, and basically they're going to pass the the spore zone into the host, and then it's going to get into the body and multiply, and it gets into the red blood cells and makes them rupture, which causes lots of chills and fever, and then. Um, then the cycle just continues really okay. so it makes people very very sick and people who survive malaria have only a limited immunity to reinfection you can have malaria more than once okay and the control of these mosquitoes worldwide has been slowed down by the increase of resistance to pesticides like DDT but the problem is is that these uh, mosquitoes do mutate and so malaria does get harder and harder to kill. Now water molds. Water molds you would think that these would be like fungi but really mold is not just um, classified as fungi it can also be uh, protist. Water molds um, are saprophytic they live off of dead things Okay. You can find a lot of water molds and slime molds like in the woods. Okay. They have a filamentous body with cellulose, just like plants do. And they can asexually uh, or sexually reproduce. Okay. They can asexually make spores or they can sexually reproduce and produce eggs and sperm. Okay. And wo most water molds feed on dead organic matter. Some actually live on land and then they'll parasitize uh, insects and plants as well. For instance, the water mold Phytophthora, that was responsible for the 1840s potato famine in Ireland. Just FYI. And then slime molds um, exist as plasmodium and they have a slimy sheath and um, slime molds will also feed on dead plant material and also on bacteria. They are typically mobile they can ingest their food by phagocytosis but they move very slowly and cellular slime molds they can also exist as individual amoeboid cells okay here's the life cycle of these you know, slime molds here and what's going on here you've basically got um, let's see Let's see where to start here. Um, you've got sporangia formation here that um, will divide by meiosis and make spores. Okay. And then you'll have uh, fertilization. Okay. And you'll have a zygote. 
Okay. And then you'll have a young plasmodium and then a mature plasmodium and then they will um, have sporangia and then the cycle just continues. You don't have to know details about this. Okay. Don't worry.